Okay. Um, thank you, everybody, for coming. I uh, want to introduce our speaker today. Uh, first off, for those of you who know uh, Dr. Fry, you know that this is not Dr. Fry. And uh, like I said before, there was some uh, last-minute uh, issues came up, and uh, he wasn't able to come today. But uh, Dr. Tardidi has agreed to uh, give a talk. And um, you know, uh, for those of you know, who don't know Dr. Tardidi, he is a research assistant professor here at UH Clear Lake, and he's been doing a lot of work with um, uh, plasma physics. Um, his background is in electrical engineering, uh, both the uh, all the way from bachelor's to PhD level. He's been doing plasma physics for how many years? A lot. Twenty plus. <laughs> Twenty plus. And so and. Um, so he's got a lot of experience with actually different aerospace applications to plasma physics, and he worked with the um, Advanced Space Propulsion Lab at JSC for a while, and et cetera, so on. So um, what's going to happen today is he's going to talk um, uh, probably not as long as uh, most of the other seminars we've had, and then afterwards I want to meet with the students who are taking the class for credit. So. That I'll turn it over to uh, Dr. Tardini. How much time do you want to uh, give for the students? Um, however much, whatever you feel comfortable. Okay. All right. Um, well, nice or now, except it wasn't for me, but um, um, trying to fill the gap. Sorry, we'll be maybe a little rambling talk because uh, I wasn't really planning to do this. We'll have another one next week which I'll be more prepared for. Um, this is what, uh, a little more detailed talk perhaps than a general overview, although I inserted some topics that may be of general interest. And please do ask questions as, as we go. Don't, don't wait at the end. Um, uh, this is uh, the big picture, and uh, um, I'm gonna touch basically some of the, the fusion business um, this uh, title refers to a magnetic nozzle, and the magnetic nozzle fits into electric propulsion, and electric propulsion fits here. And uh, this uh, research topic, at least for what we're concerned here, kind of took a little bit of a modification. One is a very detailed analysis of the processes of the plasma in a magnetic nozzle, which we, if you don't know what it is, will be clear in a little. And the other is a more of a high-level system study that wants to know what's going to happen in the best possible case scenario if we are really going to do this uh, fancy high-powered rocket and we want to go to planet. Um, it's it, it's nice to build an engine and and having a system to to accelerate the plasma to do plasma propulsion, but it won't be enough because we, we have to make sure this plasma is, is getting out of the rocket the right way. And also, and that's something that has not really been uh, heavily studied so far, the whole machine has to be relatively speaking efficient and light. We're putting a tons and tons of metal to, to, to create these things in one work, okay? Um, all right, so um, fusion. Now you can, you you'll see here the, the word fusion, and and uh, that's something that some people um, are familiar, but some people that are not familiar maybe get just a superficial press. Uh, and and right now, fusion doesn't have that great of a reputation. Okay, um, so I'm trying to maybe correct a little bit this this. Uh, idea um now this is supposed to work okay so everybody knows what what we're talking about um this is just a classic lithium fission reaction um why we want to do this we want to produce energy we want to produce energy to use this energy for many reasons on earth and in space will be very nice because in space we don't have that much energy the sun is there and it's good only if you go around the earth maybe to mars certainly not much further than that and nuclear power, like, well, this is nuclear too, by the way, but um, people, when they talk about fusion, take off the, the aggregate nuclear because 
you know, immediately people say, hey, nuclear, that's bad. So people say fusion, or people say nuclear fusion, okay? But uh, nuclear is, is typically efficient business. Um, but anyway, the, the nuclear uh, um, reactors are, are an interesting option and probably the, the only real option right now to get high-power fusion, uh, sorry, high-power electric propulsion, uh, except they're kind of heavy. All right, the <clears throat> current fusion experiments are large, expensive, and heavy. That gentleman there is sitting inside the Zone European Total, which today is still the biggest machine in the world in, in the UK. It's a, a European consortium. Um, it was built in the 80s, I believe. It was supposed to be shut down in 1992, and then kept, kept going. Um, the US, uh, current biggest facility is in, uh, in San Diego, the General Atomic Tokamak. Um, there used to be another in Princeton, the Dismantle. Uh, of course, you know, fusion works, but we can't do what Sun is doing. The Sun has the advantage of having a tremendous mass. We can keep all stuff together, just gravitational. Fusion has to have some other way to do it. Um, the previous machine that you saw was, was that the Tokamak, um, it's named Tokamak machine, uh, it's Taurus, it's the donut, and the plasma is inside. Of course, you know, when the machine runs, uh, there's nobody in there, obviously. Um, the, the plasma is somewhere in the, in the middle of that machine. It's kind of a D, D, D shape, and those, those are actually D shaped, D as in, as in delta, as the letter D, uh, cross section. Um, well, we, we did, we did make fusion happening, obviously. Um, the H bomb is, is a fusion bomb, uh, and except that uh, it, it, you can't control it. And it's the same business as the A bomb, uh, except that we found a way to control the, the fission reactor. We haven't found a way to control the fusion reactor as well. As far as the progress that we're, and why, why I'm talking about fusion in, in, in relation to an, an electric propulsion system, is because fusion indeed has made a lot of progress. And, and if you look at, you know, uh, compared to progress that's been done in electronics, for example, that's pretty actually remarkable. We started, uh, that those are, you know, the fusion power, um, in many of us in, um, up there all the way. So we realize that the, the, the slope of the fusion research and results is much steeper, despite the fact that everybody is amazed at how much memory and chips, uh, power we have today. But we have a lot more fusion power compared to, you know, what we used to have. So we're doing well in that sense and and the investment worldwide are, have been, well, we're, we're actually on the top uh, when they were the oil crisis, but uh, uh, eventually went down a little bit. All right, so uh, this is the big picture of fusion. Now, um, what's the, the bottom line is, that you, you may want to take home today is that, um, that, that they've been, people have been studying, looking at the big picture of system studies and see what we're going to do if we had the most best possible rockets and how far we can go. Um, and it always boils down to that parameter alpha, which is sometimes it's expressed that way, sometimes it's the opposite, but it's the same thing. It's kilogram per kilogram, kilogram per kilowatt. Uh, so the dry mass of the rocket divided by the power that you put on board. If you know that number, you can easily find a trajectory, an optimal trajectory from here to Mars to here to Jupiter, figure out how long it takes to get there. And, uh, and then inside that alpha, everything you know about propulsion and the rocket uh, and, and, uh, uh, power to power station, uh, power plant, let's say, it goes in there. Okay? So, uh, you can have a heavy power plant and a light rocket or, or vice versa, or a lot of fuel and a very light engine. At the bottom line, we have to have a dry mass divided by power on board. That is good. Okay, good is good. Well, that number should be about one. If it's less, it's better. If it's greater, it's not. <clears throat> For electric propulsion, uh, with the uh, current uh, fission reactor technology, we are struggling a little bit. We may even go up to five. Okay. Um, fusion rockets, mean fusion reactor power rockets. Um, may push it down to one of the row, and those are results of fishing studies that have been done, um, mainly paid by NASA. Um, the Glenn, uh, Goddard, um, Marshall, 
Trade Center. And uh, lately, believe it or not, JSC. And I was uh, actually helping somebody with this, doing this kind of stuff. Um, but the, the bottom line is that uh, without this, this uh, high power um, electric propulsion, um, uh, high power means megawatts, many megawatts, okay? We're not going anywhere. I mean, it, you, can, you can delude yourself thinking that we're going to explore the solar system with the conventional technology. And you could, in principle, if you build a lot of heavy rockets and send them to, to orbit and then assemble there and then finally get somewhere in, you know, six months or whatever, and you stay alive after, you know, getting bombarded by radiation and come back. But it's not a mission that, you know, you, you envisage to be uh, appealing. For, for exploration, it's like you know, almost like once in a lifetime kind of thing. Um, I, most people agree with me. In here. So um, the ideal thing would be today. This is the best we can possibly imagine. Okay, um, what is called direct fusion propulsion. And, and here's the nozzle. Okay, well you'll see why the nozzle is there. It's actually critical. Uh, and so the, the study that, that I've been working on was, was uh, focused on what the plasma is going to do through that nozzle, both from the point of view of the plasma dynamics itself and from the system, system study as far as seeing what energy we need to have out, getting out versus the one we're getting in and how, what's going to happen to the efficiency and what kind of a parameter constraint we have on the side of the thing. Um, we'll be clear maybe a little more for those that are not familiar why we have to have that system like that, but let me, let me point out one thing about this, this concept of the direct the propulsion means that you have a fusion reactor, I'll put the sound there, obviously, it's, it's, it's a joke, but, uh, and the, um, the idea is that you produce plasma flow directly out of the fusion reactor. And so the efficiency is as good as you can get. There is an indirect scheme, which essentially you see, uh, which, which means that you're producing electricity only from the fusion reactor and then it's pumping into a rocket and you see what, what it is like. Um, so this is the best possible scenario. And that, you know, even with this scenario, you have to really push the limits of technology and step a little bit to get down to those alpha, down below, below one. Right? And alpha, alpha below one will, will get you, you know, trip to Mars and Jupiter you know, in, in the month time frame, depending on the payload, of course, depending on the energy, uh, as opposed to, you know, year time frame. Um, so, um, with that picture in mind, we can see uh, a little, couple more details. Um, so, okay, so that's what I was starting from. Um, now, in, of course, the reactor has to be something reasonable. Um, this study was done back then, um, both at the uh, University of Washington and General Tom. Um, this is called CoFRC, a super configuration, the plasma confinement toroidal sort of. It's not a tokenized, and it's got the feature that some of the sea lines naturally open up and get up. Okay, that, that immediately uh, presents an opportunity for plasma propulsion for some of the plasma flow will, will naturally flow out of there. Uh, so if, if the confinement is, uh, is good but not, uh, but not perfect, which is always the case, some plasma will leak out. And, and if you are clever enough to design the system, you get a leak of the temperature that you want, and that leak can be used for propulsion. Um, this uh, is a, a actual experimental activity, um, and it's been going on for a while. Um, mainly, the ideas about fusion propulsion were, um, like like I said before, uh, using a reactor. In this case, it would be the, the FRC, not the Sun, obviously. To power, uh, to power what? To power a rocket, okay? The rocket is a plasma accelerator plus a magnetic nozzle plus a magnet. So, uh, this, this reactor in this picture here is just producing electricity, it's a battery, okay? 
if you have a very powerful light battery, you can just replace it with a battery. That thing is, is just an electric propulsion system, indeed, where the electricity goes uh, mainly to the plasma accelerator. And you probably know about the battery project uh, here in, uh, in Houston, and that's exactly well, without the rocket, without the reactor, obviously. Uh, you accelerate the plasma and you, you convey the plasma through a, a, a channel, and that will be the magnetic north. Uh, you, need, you need power, you need electricity, right? And, and there's an inefficiency in, in embedding the system. This is why it's called uh, indirect, because uh, fusion power uh, coming from the fusion reactor already comes with its own efficiency. There are losses in the fusion reactor, obviously, like everything else. Right? So you got losses in the fusion reactor, then you got losses in plasma solar, then you got losses on the magnetic, and losses in the magnetic nozzle. What you're getting out of the exhaust is now what you wish, not that for the end. And so, ah, the question is, are all these losses uh, something that we can live with? And when we go back to the alpha that I presented you before, a kilogram per kilowatt, just remember that when you leave here, kilogram per kilowatt, okay? I, I, I'm going to put a rocket in space, and this thing has, a, you know, 200 kilowatts, uh, one megawatt, how much it weighs? That's worth a ton, 100 pounds, and makes a whole difference. Okay, and then at that point, you were able to literally to plug the number into a computer program and figure out how long it takes to get to Jupiter or to Mars. Only then, uh, the reference out there. Yes, yes, yes. Um, okay, so uh, the, the question here, yeah, you can work on the magnetic nozzle, you can work on plasma accelerator and everything, but everything has to be nicely joined together and feeling the inefficient as much as possible. You know, the best possible magnetic nozzle, exactly, Plan accelerator will, be, you know, basically make your 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 uh, endeavor work less and vice versa. So um, this is what, uh, of course, happens when uh, you go to direct fusion propulsion, which I presented before. You remove a, uh, some inefficiency in related to the plasma accelerator, and you get this plasma flow already getting out of the fusion reactor. Okay, so this is the best best possible work. Um, uh, this is another concept which is essentially the same uh, as far as direct fusion propulsion, which I, I've been working on a little bit. Uh, and, and the idea is that instead of accelerating a plasma, uh, you're still creating this sort of FRC, sort of sort of smoke rain uh, shaped plasma, but uh, you are accelerating the actual rain and not the plasma. And in, in, in the standard sort of conventional, more conventional, more uh, com common plasma acceleration plasma, plasma uh, proportion concept. The idea is to accelerate the plasma and then it's somehow, somehow getting the plasma out of the rocket. Uh, whether it's, it's in a form of a blob or a ring, we don't care, as long as it gets out and leaves the rocket and doesn't come back. Uh, well, this is, this comes a little uh, different because we are forming a plasma closed plasma configuration becomes autonomous inside the machine itself, and then you accelerate that sort of a ring. That's actually been done. It's not, not, uh, but it's been done at very low density. And they've done it uh, north of the center in the Western Alabama, and they went to Washington as well. And in similar fashion, um, I mean, the creation of this ring, okay, not, not, not like that. Not, not with the whole acceleration speed. Uh, but, but the idea is that, uh, essentially, again, you have a, a, a system that uh, produces the energy that you need for the acceleration, for the propulsion, already there inside, inside the fusion, assuming that fusion happens inside the fusion plasma. And you don't have to have this reactor and then some electricity converter that produces the right power that you need. By the way, you need certain house conditions, okay? Some rockets uh, need a radio frequency for accelerating their plasma. And so you have to be able to power the, the acceleration uh, stage with the right voltage and the right current. If you have a nuclear reactor, a fission reactor, and uh, you want to get power on the fission reactor, what are you going to use? Well, you can use the conventional steam conversion system which is typically very efficient and also uh, it may not get to the right current and right voltage. You know, you're going to put the transformer on it. That's that heavy. Okay? You're going to have power condition. You're going to have a little 
with a power station to a power station on, at the end of the rocket. Uh, so all the things that need to be considered. And you know, every time you have a time, you say it's a disaster. Okay? Uh, so it, 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 you, like, you really want to be careful with, with just sending this, this thing. So the simpler, the more straightforward, the better, typically, generally speaking. All right. So um, now the question may arise naturally, why we worry about fusion for space? You can't even do it on Earth. Okay, what's the point? And it's like, uh, are we dreaming or something? Uh, well, um, there is uh, actually, uh, as of today, and you can go on the web and check the latest uh, roadmap, another uh, roadmap, uh, propulsion uh, fusion is being inserted. Okay, and this is the result of somebody, uh, a JC that we pushed hard for that, uh, which I, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to have helped this, this process. Um, so, um, so okay, we still doesn't answer the question, okay? It's, uh, um, why? What do we do? Well, if we want to go somewhere and say two, um, two, two decade timeline for, for, uh, for a space mission somewhere away from the Earth, all this will be, you know, the, the president's plan, we're talking about going maybe to the asteroids, other people want to go to Mars first, and it doesn't matter. Uh, there is a convergence of opinion that we want to go somewhere besides 400 kilometers from the surface into the space age. Okay? It's, you know, people call it space. Uh, it's actually space, and there's a, there's a lot of islands there, and it's really totally empty. Um, so if we want to go somewhere there, we have to start now. Okay? We're not going to develop this technology in two months. So, okay, fusion is not... Um, an option right now as, as an energy source, but um, if the uh, aerospace sector gets into this, we'll have new blood, new, new money, new ideas, okay? We make it even more efficient, we're trying to make it more efficient, uh, it's possible to be streamlined. Right now, the, the, the fusion experiments on Earth are massive, heavy, take a lot of power, a lot of people, Cost a lot of money. The biggest machine is being built right now, as we speak, in France, in near Cadarache, in the uh, uh, southwest of France, for the uh, very great location, obviously, in the great place to go. Um, um, this machine is international and it costs, projected cost about uh, 10 billion uh, euros or dollars in Europe. Um, um, well, we, we, uh, we don't. We're not putting that kind of money into, into, into this kind of thing. We're putting money in other, uh, other ventures, uh, more destructive, in my opinion. And that's bad, but, you know, $10 billion are there. There's even $100 billion, but we don't, I mean, they're not put in there. So $10 billion is a lot of money for that. And, and the value is, you know, you mind it. It is great. I mean, but it has to be intelligible because so far, fusion, uh, research has, said that bigger is better, it's more stable, more predictable, more controllable. So when they built this bigger and bigger token, right, they were able to actually make it working pretty good. They didn't produce more energy than they consumed. They did it for a little bit, but not for, for too long. And then they got unstable. So there's a lot of indication this machine will work, but there's a way to go. Okay, And, and uh, this machine, uh, as much as similar machines, they're so heavy that even thinking about putting that on a spacecraft, it's just ludicrous. There has to be some other way. Now, if this, this aerospace actually, and defense, by the way, defense can be very interested in this kind of thing. Um, uh, not because they want to go to Mars, but because they want to, they may want to maneuver assets in orbit. Assets can be anything, right? We don't know what it is. But this asset can brought them down in orbit, changing the orbital plane, Go at L1, come back. I mean, you can do all the things. And say fusion power, hey, you know, you can keep this heavy assets up there and move it right there where on top of the, you know, position you need in a matter of, you know, a minute instead of sending a bomber. Well, that's a pretty interesting, right? And don't tell me that DOD doesn't have the money for doing this kind of stuff. Of course they do. Now, if you present a case, it actually, you know, is a case. Um, there's a precedent, okay? I think it's, it's worth to mention that 
and, and that's fine. Okay. Uh, what happened when we went, went into the room? We had computers and computers were heavy and you know it's got a lot of power and we couldn't put it on the Apollo. So uh, so they invented the integrated system. And so the, the the rush and the push were going to the moon forces towards uh, industrial development and and this could happen to too. I mean we have one more reason to make things lighter and better, okay? Faster, cheaper, and better. Somebody, somebody said that before. Huh? Um, all right. So um, I've been talking about fusion plasmas and what is a plasma. Everybody knows what a plasma. Skip this. Maybe it's just a little. Um, that plasma is not a fourth state of matter. Okay. Forget about that. It's a first. It happens first. In the beginning, you have plasma. They can tell about something even even before the beginning, right? You know, they can invent a relativity model and goes all the way down to the beginning of a big bang before even plasma. But um, anyway, that the plasma is uh, a ionized gas um, with certain conditions, okay, which are called quasi neutrality and collective behavior. That's why we can control plasma. We cannot control gas very well. We can control gas uh, only in a, in a pipe. We can control plasma with a magnetic field. We can shape them. We can heat them. We can accelerate them. And everything happens with electric means as opposed to with uh, as opposed to with mechanical. And that's a tremendous advantage. Um, the um, I'm not going to go through this uh, in details, but uh, plasma is everywhere, and, and some of some plasma are, are present in uh, our our everyday life. Uh, we are working mainly on the high density plasma for uh, this kind of applications. We want to have a, something closer to a, a gas that has a certain pressure, perhaps a little, maybe a little less, that gets heated up and accelerated in the propulsion. That's what we'll go through a, through a magnetic nozzle. But, uh, and so it's for, for a magnetic fusion, uh, dense plasma will give you more energy. A, a very you know low density plasma will have a very low energy content, but it can be extremely interesting and extremely also uh, worthwhile to study because, for example, these this big solar sort of flares that we had uh, lately, as many as others, those are very tenuous plasma that that come from the sun and, and hit the Earth with high energy particles, you know, just enough to mess up satellites if you don't take the proper precaution. <clears throat> Uh, there is a there's a simple way to calculate how many uh, what what is the gas or the plasma and uh, you can calculate easily how many ions you have in in this atmosphere and atmosphere by knowing the temperature and the density and um, other other parameters are uh, typically uh, mentioned as the bilent which is a collective uh, collective effect uh, uh, reference length. And you can you can tell if uh, if uh, if the plasma containing to a domain is much bigger than, than this divine end, uh this will behave like a plasma. So you can actually confine it, you can heat it up, as opposed to just having a, a gas that behaves in a sort of a random fashion. Um, this will happen in a plasma. Let me show you. Now you have we have an ionized gas. Okay, so the plus, the minus, the electrons, and the purple are the neutrons. If I insert a, a, a positive charge, like a rod, metal, something, okay, because it's positive, the negative charges are going towards the positive charge and then in the positive goes away, right? So look at this versus that. Um, so I'm, I'm squishing away the positive. Well, there is a distance beyond which uh, the uh, positive charge that I inserted will be pretty much screened by all these bunch of electrons around. And so you will see zero shock. That distance where everything is screened is the bilent and that distance will tell you if, if something is behaving like a plasma or not. This is a basic picture that is presented in introductory courses to uh, understand what a plasma does. So it, the difference between ionized gas is it's like this and a plasma is that a plasma is big enough that you can have this kind of effect and this sort of shielding effect. Uh, this uh, something that actually is, is used currently in uh, this concept is used currently in many technologies, including the uh, 
uh, machines that produce chips, integrated circuits, where they use plasma for doing etching on the wafer that is made by semiconductors. Um, Okay, I'm not going to go into the uh, formula, but th this is just to give you an idea what the plasmas are. It's pretty much the same thing we had before. So we, we're ranging in a, in a very uh, large, uh, um, very large numbers, okay, for density and temperature. And this Debye length is telling you whether it's a plasma or not. For example, in the interstellar media, um, the Debye length is a meter. That means that if you are uh, in, in space and, and you're looking at things on a small scale this much, okay, you have fluctuations of positive and negative charges because of the, you know, solar wind or things like that. Uh, not, not even, well, or even less at solar wind, but, uh, it's a passive view of here. Um, the length is so low and so you have to, you see this fluctuation, there's almost no plasma. You have to go really several meters away, uh, to, to say, to see the, the plasma effect, the collective effect. When you are in a, in a very dense plasma, things are much smaller, okay? In a, in a solar atmosphere, of course, you know, it's like getting smaller and smaller, everything is denser and hotter. Uh, beautiful things that plasma do, they get confined, and that's why they're using, we're using magnetic field, and this is really not much different from a magnetic nozzle, really. Uh, it's a mirror, but, but these opening fields are what, what typically magnetic laws look like. Uh, so the, the, the plasma particles are like to, to spiral around the magnetic field line. So wherever the field line goes, the particles sort of go. And that's how we keep them, we keep plasma together because when they get really hot, we don't want to make them touching a, a wall or something. It would be a, a, a serious damage on the surface. Okay. So now we know everything about plasma. What happened here? All right, so the nozzle. Um, to uh, <clears throat> saying before with this fusion propulsion business uh, is uh, um, is pushing some system side that is that affecting also the magnetic nozzle. In particular, uh, if you remember that uh, idea of the direct fusion propulsion, uh, and you can put yourself in the best possible scenario to see what how good this rocket would be if that's do everything right. Uh, well, doing everything right, among other things, includes to have a fusion uh, reactor that is uh, is uh, very efficient and, and, and give us uh, the least problem. And um, typically, uh, when you have radiation in some form of neutrons, you have trouble because the uh, neutrons are hard to control. They are causing problems if humans are around. You have to shield them. Um, and so the, the fusion system reaction, reaction the one I showed before, uh, which is the best candidate for fusion on Earth, is probably not very appealing for space because it produces a lot of new neutrons. Um, these neutrons, you either have to shield them and throw them away and you're losing all energy or convert them into electricity. And the only way we know to convert neutrons into electricity is to use a steam cycle, which is uh, very efficient and hence. That's why we go to thinking about, okay, what about an anatomic fusion proposal? What does that mean? It means that basically there are fusion reactions, reactions that do not produce neutrons. And when, when they, they, these elements fuse, that they produce only uh, charged particles. Well, that's great because uh, we can confine the charged particles. We can even produce energy directly uh, without using the steam power. And, um, so the best possible world is probably from ionic fusion. Um, these are these are reactions that require a lot more energy that we currently put in, in the conventional machine, and that's one more reason why maybe aerospace can can push uh, towards a, a little different paradigm for for studying fusion. Um, typically, these are using a deuterium helium three. Uh, if she's the one that has the most, uh, the, it's most appealing for energy production, or proton boron 11, uh, proton so hydrogen and boron 11, which is, a, these are very con conventional materials. Uh, helium 3 is actually very rare, unless you go to the moon. Uh, so proton boron 11 is, and the helium 3 are the two uh, reactions that are considered for neutronic fusion power. Um, 
the idea is to use a high power electric thruster and uh, direct fusion propulsion. Now you know what direct fusion propulsion is. Um, and, and, and see what you're going to do with it in terms of how you're going to produce a jet that gives you the right, the right propulsion. Um, to generate thrust, because ultimately you have to have something that pushes you in space. Um, and you have to understand what's happening with the, the plasma when it leaves the nozzle, because uh, uh, if it doesn't attach, if it doesn't go away, you can't you nothing. Like if you have this magnetic system and you can find the plasma, then it's because the magnetic field lines always close to one another, uh, if the plasma really follows the field lines like a train on the track, eventually go back to the station and start it. And that's bad because you're not getting no, no stuff, right? And if you're, you're kicking stuff out and it comes back and hits it from back, you can go nowhere. Um, so the detection is important. And, and uh, so these studies that, uh, that I'm talking about uh, are also referring to the detail of the physics and understanding how we're going to get the plasma out. Uh, at least in most of it, at least in the most efficient way. Certainly, some some of this plasma will heat up in the process of of, uh, of expanding and, and being accelerated. And when you have something that has a temperature and and uh, heats up, uh, the energy that is in the perpendicular direction compared to the direction of motion is completely useless for propulsion purposes. Ideally, you would like to eject out of an ordinary nozzle a cold plasma with directed energy only in the direction of thrust. This is impossible. Uh, you always have some tension, okay? The magnetic nozzle is something that will try to make this, this temperature the least possible and making the energy directed the most uh, that you can possibly have. But some, some losses are, in, that are intrinsic to the, to the physics itself. Uh, the magnetic nozzle is very, and this name De Laval you see here actually, uh, somebody is familiar with uh, uh, conventional rocketry. Uh, the Laval is with a conventional gas dynamic nozzle that is used, you know, in every rocket, and it's simply redirecting the, the flow of gas by, the, because it's got its shape, it changes continuously. It, it redirects the, the temperature of the gas from the perpendicular direction, mostly in the, in the longitudinal direction. Without the nozzle, the rocket tank will be extremely efficient with just a blow a bunch of gas every day and with a minimal, minimal control. Okay, so the nozzle is very uh, uh, essential, but uh, in conventional rockets, the gas are hot, but not so hot that this metal on the nozzle cannot handle. Um, with plasma, we can't afford to have just a metal touching the, the, the plasma because the plasma is very hot. And, and so we have to have a magnetic nozzle, which is essentially a, a magnetic field shape. It's more or less the same way as, as a conventional nozzle. It keeps the plasma also in almost the same way. And, and, and it kind of does a trick of changing, turning the, the, the temperature into in direct magnetic energy. Well, this is a lot more than I said, obviously, in this slide. No, I mean, heck, heck. Um, this, uh, um, I want to just focus on this free connection business here, um, and we can talk about the beta if you want. If you heard it, we can talk about that. Uh, the reconnection is something that happens in nature, and the reconnection refers to the magnetic reconnection, the field line. Um, on the sun, there's a magnetic electron magnetic field. On the sun, sometimes there's this blob of material that get out. Okay, this is called coronal mass ejection of flares, depending on the intensity and system. Uh, what really happens on the sun is that the the plasma, the sun is this plasma, it's all, all stars are made of plasma, obviously. Uh, it's a big blob of plasma. Uh, because of stability, instabilities that occur on the sun itself, uh, the magnetic field that is on the sun gets stretched out towards the outside by the plasma that's trying to leave. Almost like the plasma is attached to the rubber band to the sun. If the plasma has enough energy, the stability has enough energy, you can stretch this, this rubber band so much and so far that the field lines close. You'll see it, the picture in a little bit. They close, and the moment they close, this thing is not attaching more to the sun and it closes. Okay, and this is more or less what we're trying to get here, okay, so this, with this uh, magnetic nozzle that is ejecting plasma. 
the physics is a little more complicated, obviously, but this is a big picture. Um, okay, this is this is a, 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 a pictorial presentation of what that was. So imagine the magnetic novel being a so simple dipolar field, the magnetic field in the black line is produced by one coil. Okay, so the coil obviously is in the in the middle where the, the field is more concentrated. It's injecting plasma on one, one end and it gets on the other side. Uh, if, if the plasma is able to uh, distort the magnetic field a little bit, like it does on the sun, and it stretches those three lines, you see that in the third, in the third picture, uh, the red line is, that is getting a close to a drop, like a water, like a dro uh, water uh, drop from the fossil. Similar, similar uh, picture also, the magnetic, a little uh, stream of water that gets in the top. Eventually, if that if that is really stretches enough, those, those, uh, the red line closes into a circle, and if you take a circle and make it rotating in the middle direction, you actually get the totals, and you get this, this ring that gets up. Okay, so first approximation without without any any uh, instabilities or modes in the single direction, that thing goes out as a ring. It may not be a ring, maybe some kind of blob distorted, but it, 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 that's that's the, the 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 conceptual picture of a reconnection occurring in this opening field. Okay, in the sun it's similar, except that the sun is kind of closing the field. The field is always closed somewhere. So those lines are sort of closing, and so the distraction happens more on the, on the other side of the of the field mm -hmm. as opposed to this one. Um, I'm going to skip on this. The um, this is a, a, a one one reason why this thing happened. Just look at the picture. Uh, you have a, a B field directed as, as, as over there, and it's in the plasma. Uh, you have a pressure gradient towards the inside. Okay, that means that the pressure is higher, higher in the middle and lower outside. Well, physics uh, tells you that if you have that situation in a plasma, you have a current J, current density in that case. It's equal to the cross bar of the B and, and the gradient. It's called dynamic current. And this is a natural tendency of the plasma to react to the magnetic field that tries to constrain and confine. So uh, that phenomena, that physics, is one good candidate for explaining uh, why we would why would we would have this kind of uh, picture here? It's kind of distortion of the field line because the plasma that goes through is creating a magnetic field of its own. And this magnetic field of its own with, it has a current, as I said, if there's a magnetic current, the current creates a magnetic field and the field interacts or su uh, superimposed to the uh, ex external field. So um, with this simple picture, can we actually do something better and, and, and look at what's happening in reality? Um, and we have to use computers. Okay, that's I'm, I'm done with with the hand waving things and simple formula. That's, that's that's pretty much as far as we can go. I mean, you can go a little more. Okay, some plasma theorists may be very upset now, but you can go that much further. Uh, so you got to use computers. Um, this is the general picture. Well, ten minutes ago, you want to just wrap it up. So let me show you what uh, um, what we're doing with this uh, uh, simulation of this novel. Um, we have a code that is uh, an MHD code, and it uses the same the, the equation of uh, magnetohydrodynamics, which is essentially Navier-Stokes equation, fluidodynamics plus plus electromagnetic field. And this is a better better picture where you have a. a Something's called ideal MHD, resistive MHD. You may not know all these terms, but um, with this code, um, we can actually simulate um, a, a plasma flow. And I'm going to show you some picture of that. Um, in doing so, in this simulation, we can actually study what we're interested in, efficiency, 
uh, how well the, the, the magnetic field insulates the plasma from the walls, uh, how the high, how power scalability becomes an issue or not, if frog produces instabilities or not. All these models are, are uh, powerful in terms of predict, predictive capability, and, and engineering can benefit a lot of that. Um, this is a, a picture, a snapshot of the simulation, where uh, you see a, a different colors for the density, and uh, the, the, gray, the gray black lines are the magnetic field, in, in a nozzle. So instead of, instead of having the nice uh, smooth uh, nozzle is opening now, we see that steel lines are low, low thickness. And that's because the plasma is going through and, and this, this, this effect is actually perfectly consistent with this diamagnetic picture that I presented before. Um, if you are letting the thing go, uh, assuming that Let's see what happens here. Okay. I don't think this media will be able to do it. Is that Windows, regular Windows 7 here? Yeah. Oh, okay. So I assume the same will happen here. Um, yeah. Well, what I was going to show you, but I'll show you, I have some, some still pictures that make a similar effect. Um, what I was going to show you is basically is, uh, is this moving through, okay? And in one case, it, it, it kind of hits the wall at the end, in case you have the actual uh, machine, like a confining plasma tank. Uh, in another case, it just goes through, in case you have a rocket open the space. Okay, so you can you can simulate that, but this is, doesn't tell you much. Uh, I, this is uh, another picture with much finer lines. Uh, you see that there is a perturbation here and some microseconds later is here, okay, in this, in this field. Uh, now I'm going to take this picture and, and, and uh, shrink a little bit, so I have an obsession in, in the vertical direction, so you will not see the real aspect ratio, so I'm simulating something 10 meter, meters long to 1 meter high. So in the real life, it should be very, very thin, okay, I'm going to see a square almost like this, okay. Uh, so this is one part of the magnetic nozzle. Uh, imagine this will go around, okay? And the sea lines are being twisted by the plasma that is going through. Uh, I'm injecting plasma from the corner, like here, okay? And this plasma is going through the sea lines. Now, this is just a plot of the sea lines, so the, it's not uh, it's not uh, perfect everywhere because you have what you have a gazillion points and the plot will be unreadable. I have to cut some field lines to show you what's happening. Uh, but the field, are, field lines are continuous, okay? They start from, from, from everywhere, they're everywhere, okay? Uh, so the plasma is going through here and kind of follow the field lines. And so and if I switch fast, you'll see that there is a formation in the heaven, okay? See, uh, the plasma is injected, it goes along field lines and then reconnected. They created this sort of a ring shaped thing and it keeps going, okay? And it shrinks and it moves and it's, you know, a little bit unstable. Um, and you are pretty much far than about four meters uh, from the, yeah, about three, three meters from the, from the, or imagine this is really fresh long, okay, it's not off the way you look. Uh, and, and that's a picture of what may happen. Uh, it could be the felines, okay, so the plasma is more or less following the felines, but the second configuration is the test. For all intended purposes, okay? It, can, it keeps going without any further uh, interaction from, from the original uh, confining field. Um, so uh, the model is able to, to, to look at this kind of thing. So this is actually a two dimensional run. In 3D, uh, things may I call a little more complicated. I mean, we're trying to gearing up for, for making bigger runs. It'll take a lot more computer time. All this is done. In parallel computers, there's a, there's a lot of stuff behind this, okay? And to produce one picture like this, it's not, uh, not as simple. Um, um, okay, so this was about the direct fusion propulsion. You put this, this plasma here, uh, what you're gonna do with it? And the last thing that I wanna mention is that uh, if you're using this, this idea of plasma, throwing plasma into a magnetic nozzle, 
uh, there is a, a, an issue. You have a plasma uh, that is produced by fusion reactor. If this fusion reactor is uh, producing alpha part alpha particles at high speed, as, as fusion reactors do, you put them into a, a magnetic nozzle that do nothing because they're going too fast. Uh, you have to have a, a um, you have to have a slower fusion product if you had it to get some uh, some real propulsion that is useful for for missions. Okay, so you have to slow down this 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 fast particle to get on the fusion. You can you can make them go through some slush gas and 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 slowing down the particle, heating up the gas, and then using a magnetic nozzle to eventually accelerate it the way you want it. But uh, this, 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 this products are going too fast. So we'll, we'll go through the gas in, in a flash. It won't be able to get anything. So we'll try and look at what, what could be done. And one way to do it would be to inject the, the particles from the fusion reactor sideways so that even they're going that fast, they'll start rotating around the fuel line. As they rotate, they heat up with this lower, lower speed gas. And eventually, they heat up that to the right amount. And then you can put that to the magnetic mode. So that's, that's just to tell you what uh, what what kind of steps we, we, we need to go through to make, and this will be the optimal rocket, okay? This will be like the best, you know, the best. Uh, it's the physics is, it's, it's, it's there to help you up to a point. You have to be careful with efficiencies, with confinements, with radiation losses, it's a lot of stuff. Uh, so when people think, you know, oh, well, we can go to Mars and build a rocket, it's just, you know, not that, not that straightforward. Um, so I'll leave you with, uh, uh, some conclusions. Uh, these are uh, research interests that we're, we're trying to push at the OHCL here with the uh, collaboration with NASA when that's available, uh, especially when they will get out of this limbo that they are right now. Uh, a lot of stuff, and um, in, we invite students uh, into the physics program to tackle these subjects, uh, both numerically and experimentally. Uh, there's a lot of stuff, a lot of options for uh, physics, and uh, there's a reasonable opportunity there because uh, I don't think it's anything better that we can do right now for for set of space. I mean, I, I think we're just pressing the bottom line. So if somebody gets into it right now we'll find probably a, a happy solution. Any questions? Yeah, thank you. What kind of price the weight ratio can you expect when you talk about going from a month to on the planet stuff? Yeah. I, what, what would be like uh, I'm trying to trust the weight ratio uh, that you would expect using that uh, that last method I guess trying to force plasma back in the normal to go to move the market or to, to Yeah, go? it's less than one I guess to trust the weight ratio, isn't it? When you're in Right, right. For, for fusion, if you, if you do the numbers, you know, and, and you really have to put it that you can get about one or maybe less, you know, depending on what kind of what kind of fusion reactor you are able to actually build or what kind of efficiency yeah. you get. So, yeah, I'm not talking about the, the mass to the mass ratio. Yeah, the energy ratio. I'm talking about the thrust to weight. Well, thrust to weight for human mission or for, for, for robotics or anything yeah. else. Mission that if you want to get some more you gotta have Well, first of all, you have to decide you want to go with a human mission or the robotic. That makes it all a different story because obviously the weight and the payload is for humans it has to be much higher. I mean, we can send a robot to Mars with this and take a little longer, but it's not a big deal. Uh, if you're talking about mission, human missions, you know, imagine what we have. Yeah. I, I, I don't know the number for the trust of, uh, from Earth, I don't even think about stuff from Earth. I mean, it's all from uh, high orbit, perhaps, the same. Yeah, uh, yeah, I know you got a problem going from Earth to orbit, but I'm talking about orbit to orbit, for example. Let's say a manned mission from Earth orbit to Mars orbit. From geo, from geo to uh, geo from Mars. Geo, yeah. like one month or three months, I think. You Trying to be three months, what he, what he could do. Yeah, he's estimated for about 25 megawatts uh, uh, rocket. Uh, I was wondering what the first weight ratio was. Well, I think the total rush was something like that in the order of a pound. Sir? The total rush on something like that is on the order of a pound. 
Yeah, yeah, not very much for us. You know, yeah, it's continuously burning us. So when you're talking about um, a fire extinguisher, yeah, okay. yeah, because if you go to like on a file, you can't figure out bigger. The point is that it's not really the right question to ask. I mean, it, 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 because you need to think in terms of what mission you want to achieve. Okay? If you want to achieve the, the straight, straight mission, but really a straight line from the, the path as possible, okay, you, you need a lot of power. Okay? You really have a big, huge, and fast huge reaction. If you're willing to wait a little time, okay, you can stay on power, it will trade off. You get more power, less time. There's nothing you can do about that. So the trust that depends on the on the payload that you have. You need to turn to keep in terms of power, okay, which is basically four times velocity, mm -hmm. and and and, uh, and then the the mass you're on board. Okay, mm -hmm. so the, it's really power to weight as opposed to trust. Oh, right. Power to weight. Mm -hmm. Because that will that will give you the right figure to to, to say, okay, I need this number to go there in three months. If I if I have but I don't have this number of taking it six months, okay? Then, then you can do the calculation. So that's, that's, that's the critical number. That means the critical figure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that ratio has to be less than one to do any transition like that. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, time. Mm -hmm. you want to have a regular service from here to Mars, you know, say three months, round trip, something like that. Okay. With much bigger than one of the two copies, the numbers are not there. You just not know it. So you, you can build a bigger, bigger, you know, better rocket, but if the weight goes up, you're not going anywhere. You just, you know, have to carry more. It's just going to change. Could this technology be combined? Sorry? Could this technology ever be combined with power beaming? Uh, well, uh, probably, uh, you're talking about laser or particle? Uh, laser is probably going to be microwave. No, I mean, part, part, part of it, you can be part, part of it, but, but uh, uh, the problem is that a lot of beaming is okay for sending power, say, from orbit down to Earth, but the diversion, so, you know, laser beam on, uh, you know, 10 million kilometers, so it's just, you know, that's a lot. Well, you, you can build that solar sail. Okay, and, and illuminate the sail with, uh, with your beam, which will have an actually pretty wide divergence by the time you're getting away from the other slope. Um, people have been talking about sails even uh, uh, just using the solar, you know, the solar power. Um, it's so an interesting option. I like saving. Do something like that. Yeah. yeah, that would be zero, zero weight, more, more like a sail would be very well. Uh, uh, light, obviously, compared to the actual, uh, limited ability of moving, and not sure how you, uh, you know, but with orbital mechanics, you can find a way out, and then you have to get around a little bit. Um, it, it, I think it, it's probably a similar analogy to sailing versus motor boating. It's still is great, it works, but that I have some, you know, limitations in the so far you can go, so, uh, you know, be not to uh, say, are uh, we talking about square kilometers there? Yeah. Okay, uh, the the current uh, roadmap uh, in this 20 year projection, uh, what's your feeling? Do uh, you think that's realistic, optimistic? It, it's all about politics. Absolutely. Technically, it is. Technically, it is. Uh, but if we, you know, don't put the, the, you know, the funding is not there even to do basic science. I mean, it's, we were, we were, you know, we were really guilty. Well, I was hoping we were saying 2035. <laughs> <laughs> but again, that is that is something that, and there's a lot of uh, um, future projects that might turn into a better experimental activity if they were funded, you know, and they only need, you know, five million dollars, okay, ten million dollars, okay, suffered uh, in the commercial. In the commercial, uh, you know, sector, don't even people don't even think about it. So uh, the, 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 the real the problem here is that we don't put money aside for it. We don't, we don't put the money on people. Uh, and then maybe because people don't don't have enough interest. I mean, if people start getting really yay, no, let's let's do it. Then it's about a billion a year. Whatever. Along what? About a billion a year about the. 34 years, they're going to need more money than that to do it. To do what? To, oh, for, for uh, 
had enough energy to actually use. There was a sometime in the past there was an alternative concept that was um, to just accelerate beams of the neurons and collide them directly onto the particles. Yeah, I'm going to come the other uh, that ever go anywhere? Um, they did go somewhere, um, but um, the best, uh, the best, uh, interesting enough, the, the best experiment on that kind of approach to season right now is privately funded by venture capitalists investors, and they keep everything very quiet. Okay, they they uh, have something presented at the last uh, uh, American Physical Society meeting. Um, they disclose in some of their activities, but they don't tell you what really the bottom line is. Uh, they probably got something like $20 million investment in that order, I'm guessing, and they don't tell you that. The person behind that uh, is the eminent plasma physicist, uh, Norman Rossiter from uh, California, who tried to plug it actually to me and mostly a little bit. Um, he uh, is been pushing this colliding beam, as you mentioned. Uh, these colliders are not going straight, indeed. They are going into a circle, okay? But uh, they maintain what is called no Maxwellian component. So the plasma is not the Maxwellian plasma, it's not the relaxing equilibrium. It's, it's pushed away from the equilibrium, and it keeps this thing running and colliding to each other. And in doing, you're putting energy into that, and in doing so, you're achieving a better cross-section of the season reaction. And so, ultimately, the, the idea that you have gain out of it. The challenge is to maintain this non uh, equilibrium configuration, which is something really away from what nature likes, okay, um, by a physical way, okay, so the confinement at uh, very really field to rate of frequency uh, and current law. Yeah, you need a lot of energy for the focus on that. Well, the, 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 yeah, the energy is, is a function of how much uh, density you have. Uh, so, you think if you're sort of redirecting the energy instead of the thermal, the problem with plasma is that they're confined, but they, they, they want to go into it, right? So it's a high temperature plasma is hard to confine. And if you are somehow magically keeping the plasma on, on a rail track, okay, and most of the energy is along the rail, and there's a little bit of, you know, uh, moving around, then you don't have to put too much energy for it. Okay, that's the idea, right? So if you build this rail track, uh, Good enough, then the plasma keeps them going, and that's what the energy is. So that's, that's the idea. Um, it, it, in the past, uh, in the, the Department of Energy put some money into this business, um, but um, for political reasons and budget cuts and so they had to make some choices, and so they tried to redirect the funding on what, what was the most uh, likely uh, uh, experimental activity, which is the token of right now. In fact, it was an interesting phenomenon with many of these uh, researchers in the university that were used to do this kind of uh, alter alternative season concept. They were reselling their reserves as uh, support for the token. So yeah, I'm doing this, but it's really for that. Okay, So they take kind of step long. Right? So the people have been playing this sort of game that way. Uh, and, and everybody knew it. I just, you know, I had to, you know, put the right buzzwords in your proposal. Otherwise, you know, the AI might not listen anymore. It's sad, actually. Any other questions? All right, let's thank our speaker. Mm -hmm. I also want to thank him as a, a last minute replacement. So this is this is very very good that he was able to come in with such short notice. So um, yeah, uh, also I want to be able to meet with um, the students who are taking the course for um, uh, the students who are signing.